Avengers Endgame was the ultimate ending to a massive 22 movie series. But drawing all those stories into one epic movie was bound to mean some mistakes and some amazing details. We don't really know how long the wait will be for Phase 4 to truly get underway. But until that time, we have the entirely epic Infinity Saga to remind us why we should be excited. Of course, when you're on your 15th viewing, you might start noticing some stuff. Here are some of the mistakes and details that still stand out to us from Avengers Endgame. As we all know, when Captain America throws his mighty shield, all those who oppose his shield must yield. Some people never seem to get that message. So lucky for us moviegoers, Captain America threw his mighty shield a lot. The first hint that we had that future Avengers movies weren't going to end well was a vision that Tony had all the way back in Avengers Age of Ultron. What he saw was a shattered battlefield marked by what seemed impossible. Captain America's vibranium shield busted in half. That vision came true during Thanos' attack on the Avengers compound. Good thing they moved that to the countryside, huh? A hammer-wielding Captain America managed to really get under the normal dispassionate Thanos, who did his own hammering on Cap Shield. The shield remained that way, except for a brief moment, in the wide shot where Cap Shield appears whole again. Oh, it's a magic shield. We're all familiar with the rules when it comes to Thor's favorite hammer, Mjolnir. When Thor went against his father's wishes and almost kickstarted a war with the Frost Giants, he sent the God of Thunder to Midgard to think about what he'd done and put an enchantment on the hammer that meant that Thor couldn't play with it until he was worthy. But he put in the phrasing, If he be worthy, he shall possess the power of Thor. This has meant that both Vision and Captain America have possessed the power of Thor, both in spectacular moments. When Thor lost Asgard and half the Asgardians, as well as his hammer, he went straight to Nidavellir to have the dwarves there make him a Thanos killing weapon. This is no mere axe, because when Star-Lord suggests they all get one, Thor says the power would overwhelm them. Stormbreaker's restriction is the amount of power that flows through it, not worthiness. But in a cute scene totally worth it, Cap is also able to wield Stormbreaker as well. Hmm. This might be less of a mistake and more of an issue of exposition. The tension of the time heist is the limited number of pin particles available, just enough for one trip and two... Uh, one test run. Way to go, Scott. That hard number, it turns out, is a lot more fungible. He also has enough to shrink the Benatar. But at that point, we might have already concluded that they need to shrink the spaceship to get the stones. If Lang doesn't size up once through the Quantum Realm, he doesn't waste a resizing until he gets mad at Tony Stark. The biggest issue is where Thanos and company get the pin particles to shove his spaceship through time. For that, we probably have to rely on Rocket, who reminds Stark. You're only a genius on Earth, pal. Ooh, shots fired. Comedian Ken Jeong has played a number of funny characters, most of them a lethal combination of jerk and a train wreck. From Mr. Chow in The Hangover to Senior Chang in Community, Jeong's characters don't solve problems, they create them. The Russo brothers directed more than a few Community episodes before getting the call to Marvel, and they've taken some of the cast with them, including Danny Pudi in Captain America Winter Soldier, Jim Rash in Captain America Civil War, and Yvette Nicole Brown in Avengers Endgame, along with Ken Jeong as the security guard who finds a newly emerged Scott Lang. Apparently, Zhang has no curiosity as how Scott got in the locked unit to mention that the van has been there for five years and why that number is significant. He leaves Lang to ask some random kid on the street who's equally as helpful. Why are you bike riding away, kid? I just asked you a question. While you might feel like you've watched Avengers Endgame a little too much, YouTuber the Canadian lad has you covered when he watched a three hour long movie at one quarter speed, just to see what details he could find. That's include gems like the wasp-sized portal and the upside-down award in the picture of Tony and Peter Parker. Iron Man has been teasing Pepper about getting her own suit since the beginning, and in Endgame we finally got Pepper Potts as rescue, including that awesome back-to-back -back shot with Iron Man. Unfortunately, the Canadian lad noticed that rescue is shooting off into nothing. It's not just rescue. The Canadian lad has also taken on the early controversy over how exactly Thanos' sword is supposed to work. Aside from being awkward to hold while extending any power from the arm, there's that spin. The Canadian lad points out that the blades spin around the hilt, rather than Thanos' hand spinning like a weird 80s toy. But the handguard doesn't go all the way around the handle, so there's a pair of gaps in the rotation. We can probably write that off as space technology, though. Ah, space technology. Is there nothing you can't do? Another big bone of contention has been how exactly did Gamora know about the Infinity Stones and when did she know it? Back in Guardians of the Galaxy, she appears to only know that Thanos wants the orb, and whatever Thanos wants, Thanos definitely shouldn't get. 
It isn't until the collector gets excited at the prospect of getting his hands on an Infinity Stone that he explains to everyone what exactly an Infinity Stone is. However, in Endgame we see just before the events of Guardians of the Galaxy that Gamora knows what Infinity Stones are and that Thanos has found one. So when did Gamora find the Soul Stone? There's evidence that she was playing dumb for the dummies in Guardians of the Galaxy though. Even without the scene from Endgame, Thanos already had an Infinity Stone back in 2012 when he had the other give Loki the Mind Stone in order to retrieve the Space Stone from Earth. Chances are she didn't want a group like the Guardians to know how powerful their find was. The Chitauri were a pretty formidable foe for the newly assembled Avengers. That is, until the World Council decided to nuke New York City, forcing Iron Man to direct the missile into the Chitauri base ship. As it turns out, when you take out the mothership, they all just drop dead. In a deleted scene, Rocket makes fun of the Chitauri for that weakness as the easiest army in the galaxy to beat. They didn't seem to be an issue in Endgame, however. The Outriders were joined by the Chitauri for the final showdown, but even allowing for Thanos' ship acting as the mothership for the Jatari, when Captain Marvel does her fly-through, the Jatari keep fighting on. The deal that Banner makes with the Ancient One when he gets her to agree to let the Time Stone go is that the future Avengers will return the stones to the right place and timeline so as to prevent a branching out of a new reality. Of course, the Hulk's hatred for stairs and Loki's inability to let an opportunity pass means that alternate realities were created, but probably more than a few. The Time Stone can be returned the way it arrived, same with the Mind Stone and the Soul Stone, but the Reality Stone, Space Stone, and Power Stone came in distinct packages. So when Howard Stark comes back to check on the Tesseract, he'll get a Space Stone instead. When Marvel wants to power the faster than light spacecraft for the fleeing Skrulls, it will be with the Space Stone, not the Tesseract. Maybe they just got a whole bunch of those cubes lying around though, you know? The time heist went bad when Loki pieced out with the Tesseract during the mayhem meant to allow Tony to take the Tesseract, which meant they had to trip even further back in time to get the Tesseract and some pin particles. But they didn't have to work that hard, since Thor and Rocket were in a place that had its own Tesseract. Odin's trophy room held the Tesseract after Thor and Loki used to get it back home after the Avengers. Communicating over time and space would be a bit much, and trusting a depressed Thor with two retrievals might not have been the best plan. There's another problem with Thor's visit to Asgard in the Dark World. The period of time they visit doesn't exist. Jane Foster's time on Asgard is pretty densely packed. She's brought to the Soul Forge, watches her boyfriend's dad chew out her boyfriend, gets an info dump on the Aether and some Asgardian history, meets Frigga and then gets involved in a prisoner revolt. There's no time for her to take a nap, even if Odin thinks that's what he sent her off to do while he took care of the revolt, and definitely not time for Frigga to have a heart to heart with the future version of her son. Even worse, it means that future Thor takes Mjolnir while past Thor is using it. That's just rude. Never take another god's hammer. Tony Stark is always upgrading. It's what tech geniuses do. One of the areas that Stark seemed particularly interested in was suiting up. As Shuri so succinctly put it, It's old. Hey, people are shooting at me. Wait, let me put on my helmet. Tony tried robots assembling it and a suitcase before he tried remote control with some early difficulties. The nano suit was his final expression of the suiting up problem, but it seemed like he shouldn't have let go of remote control so easily. If he had been able to summon the Nano Gauntlet the way he controls the rest of his tech, the game of Keep Away could have been a whole lot easier. If your first showing was anything like mine, you couldn't hear much between On Your Left and the entire MCU coming through the portals to join the fight. It was an epic moment that brought just about everyone in the fray, even Howard the Duck. Sure, it would have been nice to see the Marvel Entertainment properties like the Defenders or Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but it was still an amazing moment. Even the Ravagers showed up, well, for a moment. After that initial entrance, the Ravager ships seemed to vanish from the battle. You don't even see them crashing down when Thanos rained fire. Makes you wonder if they just took the opportunity to loot our corner of the galaxy and get on out of there. By now, most of you are familiar with the fact that Scott Lang is supposed to be in Lewis's van hot-wiring the quantum tunnel, and another cut shows him as Giant Man punching a space monster. But that's not the only issue with the van sequence. Never mind how hot-wiring the quantum tunnel is supposed to work from the truck battery? That thing runs on 12 volts. While Scott and Hope are supposed to be fixing the tunnel, Hope, the one who built the tunnel, takes a moment to run back up for Captain Marvel on her leg of the relay race. At some point, Scott must have just given up because he survives when Thanos throws his sword into the tunnel and blows up the fan. There are some errors that only seem like errors, but are really just missing tiny bits that would let you know when things happen. That's the case with Rhodey's new suit. After Thanos' first bombardment on the Avengers compound, Rhodey found himself trapped, having to enact an emergency eject system. 
So why is it he comes out in a fully functional suit once Scott Lang goes big? Well, blink and you miss it, but Scott Lang ends up in the armory after the damage, giving him a chance to grab and shrink a new War Machine suit for Rhodey to face the final fight in. You want to look your best, after all. Another big error that's gone around is the problem of Sitwell's phone. The Battle of New York, as the giant title tells us, takes place in 2012. When Captain America joins the Agents of Hydra posing as Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in order to grab Loki's scepter, Sitwell wants to call in the change of plans. The problem, as people have noted, is that he's doing it on a Samsung Galaxy 6 that won't come out for another few years. But wait, is this an error or is this consistency? At the end of Avengers, science bros Tony Stark and Bruce Banner drive off in a brand new Acura NSX, a car that won't come out for another four years. In 1970, Stan Lee drives by in a 1971 Skylark, even though it's April. The real reason the Acura happens is product placement. But what also suggests is that a world with Tony Stark in it means technology and new products move a little faster. So Sitwell has a phone two years before he should, and Tony drives an Acura four years before our world would get a chance to drive. While we're on the subject of product placement, there are some fun little details tucked away in the sets and props of the Avengers that let you know it's a lived-in world. Something as big as a team of superheroes forming would have a huge cultural impact. As we know, a huge cultural impact means merchandising. There's a hint of that in Infinity War when some of the Avengers discuss their Ben & Jerry's flavors. There's a small throwback to that when Smart Hulk is snacking on a quart of his flavor, a Hulka Hulka burning fudge. Mm -mm. Even when Thor is done being an Avenger, he keeps some Avengers memorabilia in the form of an Iron Man Pez dispenser. There was a lot of blame to go around after Infinity War. If Peter Quill had just kept things together for a little bit, Peter and Tony could have gotten the gauntlet free, though as we've learned without his gauntlet, Thanos is no pushover. And then there's Thor and where he should have aimed. Thor carried around that guilt about not going for the head, enough to disturb his teammates when he did. The ambush on Thanos didn't get going for the head out of Thor's system, though. When he meets Thanos again, he goes for the head once again. At least he learned his lesson, you know? There's one thing we've always kind of accepted from Spider-Man. Wherever he is, there's something above to swing from. So after Thanos levels the Avengers compound, what exactly is Spider-Man swinging from? Well, we turn once again to our quarter-speed hero for the answer to that detail. He's swinging from Giant Man's fist. What we didn't see was Giant Man shaking his hand, trying to get the cobweb off. Probably wiped it on a space monster or something. Ugh. Thanos is the architect of many of the bad things that happen in the MCU. Loki attacking New York? Thanos. Ronan the Accuser and the Nova Corps? Thanos. Wiping out half of existence? Naturally, Thanos. Whoever would unleash Thanos on the universe would certainly have a lot of guilt to work out. Maybe he'd even benefit from some group therapy. Well, Jim Starlin is the man who gave the world Thanos and key members of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Fittingly enough, Starlin's cameo in Endgame, the final showdown with his sinister creation, is in the support group for victims of Thanos led by Captain America. Huh, that's pretty fitting. When Lang and the remaining Avengers approach the aggressively retired Tony Stark, they approach him with what seems like a crazy idea, time travel. For the guy who time traveled from World War II to the 21st century the slow way, at the speed of time in frozen ice, it sounds crazy. But when Tony wants to show off that time travel isn't something he thought of while watching a movie, he throws out some heady terms. And he's not just making things up. The Planck scale is a real thing that suggests minimum limits of the universe before the laws of physics break down, something that could be affected by messing around with quantum elements. The Deutsch proposition isn't a thing, but the scientist David Deutsch is. And he has some complex theories of time travel based on the idea that you can only have an idea where a particle is and where it's going at any given time. The EPR paradox that Tony uses to explain that they move time through Lang is the einstein podaski rosen paradox, a thought experiment on how quantum physics don't work with the regular laws of physics. There are two Avengers who sat things out during Infinity War, Scott Lang and Clinton Barton. They were the ones on Team Cap who had family and decided to take house arrest rather than live on the lam as rogue superheroes. We got to see what Scott Lang did with his downtime in Ant-Man and the Wasp, and at the very beginning of Endgame, we got to see the heartbreaking end to Clint Barton's downtime. Thing is though, by the time the snapping worked its way through the universe, Scott had served his time and his ankle monitor was free. So why is Barton still wearing his when his family gets the dust treatment? Well, one theory might be compounded crimes. All Ant-Man did was join the fight at the airport. He wasn't even on the UN's radar but Clint busted Wanda out of containment, so maybe that extended his sentence. Those are some of the mistakes and details that still catch our attention. Is there a little detail that sticks out to you in Endgame? 
Let us know in the comments, and while you're there, be sure to subscribe to CBR for the latest videos straight to your inbox. Thanks for watching.